Welcome to the CEC report for the 9th of February. I'm Elisa Barwick and joining me today is CEC Research Director Robert Barwick. Welcome. Thanks Elisa. And on today's show, market meltdown makes bail-in real. Don't fall for the government's assurances on deposits. And Mike Pence hell-bent on sabotaging the Peace Olympics. So firstly today, market meltdown makes bail-in real. Don't fall for the government's assurances on deposits. Now we have had some good news in our campaign to stop the government introducing bail-in laws, but we're going to talk about that in a moment. Firstly, however, what's happening in the stock market, Robert? Uh, mayhem, absolute mayhem. Now, is this the beginning of like the big a big crash that's not going to stop? I, I can't say that's the case, but I will, I will point out to people that the high watermark of the US stock market before the 2008 crash was a year earlier in late 2007, right? And you can say, so, so I'm, I've, I've no doubt that what we're seeing now is the what we call the everything bubble starting to implode. It was always going to happen. This, but in terms of the stock market in particular, the US stock market, it's purely, all of it is speculation. There is nothing substantial and tangible holding it up. They're all kidding themselves, they're all in la la land. Because what you've got is all these, the, it's machine trading, high mm. frequency trading that's driven it up, all on the on speculative promises and they, they'll, they'll make bets on anything, right? And, Any and, kind of eventuality. And companies buying their own shares, I mean, that well, drives it up. Well, that's been the, the, the biggest part of actual money going to the stock market, actual mm. money, is companies buying back their own, they've borrowed at, at virtually zero interest to mm. buy back their own shares. So that's been a big part of it. And then you've got this machine trading. And what's happened in the, this week, um, so on Friday last week, a week ago today, the US stock market went down 666 points. It followed it up on Monday with 1175 point drop, the first time the Dow has dropped over 1000 points in uh, one day. And then today, it dropped over 1000 points again, that is overnight for us. Um, so. I know that behind the scenes they'd be scrambling to try and stabilise this, but they're going to have a hard time. And the big trigger, there's lots of things you can talk about aspects of it. One of the funny things to me, Elisa, is that everyone knows that, that, that um, one of the things that went haywire was all these derivatives bets, not on the stock market itself, but on the volatility index on the stock market. And a lot of those derivatives bets have been wiped out as a result of that. So that's a humorous part of it. We can talk about that more another time. But it's the interest rate question, right? Because so much of this, what we call the everything bubble around the world, including in Australia, we'll talk about in a second, has depended on these super low interest rates. And in America, interest rates are starting to go up. And just take the part you mentioned, there's been s trillions of dollars have been borrowed by corporations to buy back their own shares at low interest, right? With interest going up, the IMF last year forecast you could get a 20% default on those loans. And a 20% default on corporate debt would be a greater default rate than the subprime mortgage bubble mm. in 2007 8 right? And on a bigger chunk of debt as well than subprime mortgages. And this could be the thing that blows out the whole financial system. So that's the, that's the backdrop to what's going on there now. And Australia actually could be a real pivot point in this global new global meltdown that we're facing. And in fact, um, there was a report that came from a British, a London, City of London investment consultancy firm Absolute Strategy Research, which was reported in the Australian Financial Review on the 6th of February, they put out a warning to their clients that Australia's banks could be a global systemic threat. And that's very significant, that formulation to our bail-in fire, which we can talk about in the next segment. Yeah, uh, and this is because their reasoning was Australia's banks represent over 25% of our local financial market and as they point out, no country has been able to sustain holding even 20% in that capacity. Um, they well, if, if you look at that graph that we're putting on the screen now, right? Yep. That show, look how much Australia's financial, the banking part of our financial system soars in comparison to the rest of the world. It's completely unsustainable. The green line the is green Australia line. at the top there. You can see it's the highest. Uh, and they, they point to, they actually point out a new um, acronym like the, the BRICS or the PIGS or whatever um, called the CANS, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Norway and Sweden. And they point out that it's these countries that after the 2007-08 GFC had 
the soaring housing bubbles that are now at risk and they point in the case of Australia to the fact that we're, our banks are dependent on a lot of overseas funding yep. which can be effect, affected by for example a rising American dollar etc. Well, uh, and, and rising in interest rates so if, if um, yeah. even if the Reserve Bank keeps our rates on hold and cuts them yep. the, the amount that we're dependent on overseas money means that as US rates go up, our banks will be paying those higher rates and, and people, mortgage holders will be paying those higher rates. And they can't handle that. Um, there's figures that came out recently from ME Bank which show that 46% of homeowners spend 30% or more of their household income on the mortgage, 26% of people spend over 40% and 14% spend over half of their income. Um, so these are horrific figures. We also had the warning this week from a leading economist, Professor Richard Holden. He said there's a real risk of some kind of US style meltdown. And he also pointed out what we've mentioned on the show, uh, that you have these interest only mortgages that after five years, many of which are coming up now, will revert to principal plus interest, which mm. people will Jump be Jump up with. more than $1,000 a month in payments, which people mm. can't handle. Yeah. So we're going to stop for a moment, but after this break, we'll come back to our campaign to stop the government dealing with a new financial crash by stealing people's deposits. Welcome back to the CC Report where we're discussing the ongoing market meltdown and now we want to talk about how our government along with other governments around the world by the prescriptions of the international banking circles such as the Bank for International Settlements, the Bank of England and so forth are, and planning, board. are planning to deal with that crash um, and after 2007-2008 there was a new policy that was introduced to alleviate the need for bailouts by governments and that was to steal the money from the bank's creditors in order to keep the banks going. And the main reason for that was so that you didn't have collapsing derivatives which, because of the way derivatives counterparties work, can turn into a massive avalanche in seconds. A daisy chain reaction that just melt down, melts down the whole global financial system. That's what they, everything they talk about in terms of bailing is geared to avert that. Mm. The ultimate, you know, we would, we would avert it, we'd cancel them all, right? Cancel every derivative and if people want to be gamblers, go to the racetrack, mm. right? Don't do it with bankers' money, but they want to be able to let people, people keep derivatives gambling and avert a meltdown by taking people's savings. So bail-in powers to do this already exist in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in the European Union and in New Zealand and there's a push for it which are various levels of progress in other parts of the world. Um, now of course in Australia last year we had our own version of this put forward which we'd been foretelling for some years and so this is uh, powers that the government wants to give to APRA that in a financial crisis they can confiscate um, certain bank holdings and the legislation we've studied it very very closely we've had experts study it and it does not exclude deposits and savings being taken and so we ran a big campaign last year which viewers would be aware of uh, we forced it to go to a parliamentary committee before it would come to the floor of the parliament which is a very important step over 1,000 submissions went into that committee, which is crucial because that has led to the breakthrough we're announcing today in that the committee, the parliamentary committee, submitted a list of questions to the Australian Treasury, to the Reserve Bank, APRA and ASIC, uh, basically demanding answers to the questions that we levelled. They were so, raised by, the questions raised by us in the CEC Dr. Wilson Sy, the former principal researcher of APRA, and the Banking and Finance Consumers Support Association that's based in Western Australia, headed up by Denise Braley, which represents a lot of bank victims. So they, 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 the, the, you know, the people, including CSC report viewers who made these submissions, mm. um, that's what forced them to take our concerns seriously. Right? If, it, if it was just one submission, they would have buried it. Mm. A thousand submissions, they had to say, well, we have to put these questions to them. That's unprecedented, getting that many submissions. Usually it's 20 or 30 or something. And by the way, as we've reported, um, they ruled out having actual hearings, yeah. uh, which usually would take place where they'd bring some of those witnesses in, the people that have made those submissions. So there is obviously an attempt to shut this down and cover it up. 
However, the fact that they pose these questions, which we'll go through so that you get a sense of what was raised, is very important. And also, I think it's, you know, it's quite funny that we forced these agencies, the Treasury, the Reserve Bank, ASIC and APRA, to sit around the table and discuss through... Co coordinate their answers. Yeah, because they actually said in their, in their answers to these questions that they consulted on this. So, you know, they had to all come in after work or something and sit around to, to do this together. So that's good. Um, so the questions that they asked, uh, firstly, they asked for a response to the submissions of us, Dr. Wilson Sy, and the Banking Finance Consumers Support Association, as you said. So they wanted a general reaction to that, to those submissions, in specifically out of the thousand that were handed in. They also asked about the clause, which um, specifies conversion and write-off provisions to certain instruments held by banks. Uh, and they asked why any other instrument is included in the wording of that legislation, not just tier one and tier two capital, but they also refer it to any other instrument. And they asked, can that be interpreted to include bank deposits? They said, does this imply that bank deposits could be subject to, in the words of some submitters, a bail-in? If no, please explain how deposits are specifically included in the legislation. Now they really Exclu sorry excluded exclude specifically excluded in the legislation, but they couldn't do that. They couldn't actually specify with detail that deposits would be excluded, could they? No, they they they're worth reading these answers, and you can go to we can put a link on the web the YouTube page, but you can go to the Senate committee page to see them. Um, the language what they they in their language they they could not be definitive when dealing with the language of the bill. Mm. So they prepared to make all kinds of reassurances. No, 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 we'd never dream of deposit. No, 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 forget it. And of course, our argument was, look, that sounds nice, but every other jurisdiction to which we're allied includes deposits. And you're telling us you wouldn't even dream of it. In fact, the Reserve Bank went so far as to attack the very concept of taking deposits, saying mm. that would cause financial instability. And in, making, in, in, going, in going that far, I think they went overboard because the headline from that is the Reserve Bank of Australia attacks the United Kingdom, the United States, New Zealand mm. and the European Union as causing global financial instability. Yeah. Well, they don't mean to say that, right? So they, were, that was, they didn't mean what they said. That proved they didn't mean what they said. Um, but when they had to deal with the actual wording of the bill, where the, where the reassurance needs to be, they couldn't be definitive. They used language like, it is not the intention. It cannot reasonably be interpreted. We do not believe, etc." Right, things like that. Um, so we, we we've put a reply to this on the um, uh, 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 as a press release, right? Which people which people can look at. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to point out about this, Elisa, is the, the to me the, there were two there were two apart, apart from Treasury, you know, tr a lot of Treasury's rep replies is what we've been getting from the government. So it's like nothing to see here. We we wouldn't do anything. Don't worry about it. Um, it's all good. All the other agencies said on most questions, um, we, we, we agree with what Treasury says. So they didn't actually answer the questions. Yeah. ASIC and the Reserve Bank, though, had to make two distinctions. They, they had to answer two, on two issues separately. ASIC was extraordinary. And the reason it was extraordinary is because one of the questions that was put to ASIC is what we have quoted from ASIC's former boss, Greg Medcraft. Mm -hmm. And Greg Medcraft, just before he quit his job, he left his job in November. He was in front of the same committee being asked about bail-in bonds, hybrid securities. And he said what we had said in a press release a, a year earlier. He said these, the banks have been allowed to sell them to mum and dad investors, which they shouldn't have. They, they're not allowed to sell them in England, for instance, but they, they've been allowed to sell them here. He said they wouldn't understand what they've bought, mm. right? These people, in other words, have been preyed upon. Is, yeah, and he said they're a ticking time bomb. And they're a ticking time mm. bomb. So our part of our submission just quoted that. And ASIC mm. had to contradict their old boss <laughs> without saying, without actually explicitly saying, no, he was wrong. They just said nothing to see here. This is, that was a huge scandal, what he said, and they've just tried to bury it ever since. And, of course, that's the thing with the, this bail-in bill 
It's mainly about those hybrid securities, but because it's about those types of securities that have been sold to retail investors, that's why we say it's really targeting Australian savings. When, when retail investors have bought those securities, they've put their savings into them. Yep. And the language with any other instrument means if it can go to those savings, they've opened a back door that it can go to all of our savings through deposits, mm -hmm. right? And then quickly, Reserve Bank, that was extraordinary because apart from going overboard to say, oh, no, no, we wouldn't even consider it, the Reserve Bank was asked to explain the difference between it, what we are doing here and New Zealand. And in New Zealand, they have a system called Open Bank Resolution, which is run by the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. And in there, there is no ambiguity. Mm -hmm. We're going to bail in everything, including deposits. They call depositors investors who've made a conscious decision assessing risk when they put their money in the bank. Rubbish. I started banking as a six-year-old with the Commonwealth Bank. That, there was no assessment of risk. It's about trust. You trust the bank, right? So the Reserve Bank of New Zealand is really feral on this. Um, yet Australia has an agreement with New Zealand where we will coordinate our response to a bank crisis because New Zealand's banks are Australia's banks and vice versa, mm -hmm. right? So we, have the, we signed this agreement in 2010. The Memorandum of Cooperation on Trans-Tasman Bank Distress Management. That was signed by the Treasury, RBA, APRA, ASIC and the New Zealand Treasury and Reserve Bank. And here's the clause that is the key clause in that agreement. For, quote, for systemically important banks, the participants will explore options for an open resolution of the parent and subsidiary banks that are most likely to be conducive to protecting the public? No maintaining stability and international confidence in the financial systems of both countries. Well, that means foreign creditors and derivatives markets, Elisa. That's what that means, and, and I'll continue, and will advise their respective governments accordingly, which means basically we're going to do this and we'll tell the government after the fact that we've done it. Mm. That's in that agreement, and yeah. we're coordinating with them, and our government wants to say, don't trust us, we'll never dream about deposits. Rubbish. Don't buy it for a second. Absolutely. Now we've got to stop for another break, but call in if you haven't already for a free copy of our weekly publication, the Australian Alert Service. It has more information on all of these topics we're discussing today. Be right back. Welcome back to the CEC Report. Now we're discussing Mike Pence hell-bent on sabotaging the Peace Olympics. Now the opening ceremony of the Winter Olympics in South Korea is today and uh, Mike Pence of course is the Vice President of the United States who's in Japan en route to the Olympics at the moment and we're just going to talk about his statements because it indicates that you have areas of conflagration such as Syria and North Korea where despite uh, Trump having pledged to wind back these wars of regime change and so forth, you have elements, the neoconservative elements, that are coming forward to distract that agenda and throw it off course. Well, there's, there's potentials there for peace, like in Syria that's finishing the war, etc., and they're determined to sabotage yeah. that as it comes to that point. So in the case of North Korea, North Korea and South Korea are going to compete together in the Olympics. In the yeah. Olympics, they're going to be unified. That's great, and that's a very significant thing because at the end of the year, the North Korean leader had said he was open to renegotiating uh, along the lines of the reunification with the South. They uh, they decided to compete together. Um, South Korea put aside elements of the sanctions to allow the talks that have begun with the North to take place and also for the Olympic participation. The US even made the decision to suspend military exercises with South Korea until after the um, Paralympics had finished. So this is quite crucial actually. Um, it was a, that was a good sign. So in that context though, Mike Pence comes to Japan and says that we're going to unveil the toughest and most aggressive round of economic sanctions on North Korea ever seen. All options are on the table. So he comes in with this real warmongering stance, um, similar to what Turnbull did similar when he was... That's right. Malcolm Turnbull did the same thing a couple of weeks ago. And Elisa, North Korea today is going to hold a military parade. And of course, they're the baddies for doing that, whereas mm. all we've seen is this rubbish from Mike Pence and yep. Malcolm Turnbull in the lead up to this. And if Pence and the US do go ahead to resume their military exercises right after the Olympics, um, really all hell could break loose as the North has just stated. And we're going to show a clip just to give some of the background of what these exercises mean to the North Koreans. This is from a video called The Haircut by my, a couple of young Aussie guys in Sydney. It's very funny that they, they made it last year to ridicule the kind of propaganda that we get fed. 
We're going to use two clips from it, but watch the whole thing. You can find it on YouTube. It's called The Haircut, but watch this part of it. Korea spent the first half of the 20th century as a colony of the brutal Japanese Empire. As Japan withdrew after World War II, the Koreans gained independence, elected a socialist government, and things were pretty sweet in Korea. For about two months, cue the big fellas. The guys who had just won World War II decided to move in. So, they randomly divided the country along the 38th parallel, with the South under US control and the North under the Soviet Union. In the Communist North, Kim Il-sung continued the land reform of the Socialist government, forcing landlords and their sympathisers to flee South. But in the South, things were a little bit trickier. The Americans expelled the Socialist government and brought back the Japanese guys that everyone loved so much, and whoever didn't love them was forced to flee North. Fueled by the two competing superpowers, this division led to all-out war in 1950 and, fearing the spread of communism, Uncle Sam and all his buddies went to town on the North. What about the bizarre military parades? That's some pretty confronting stuff. But imagine how confronting it is for them that the largest military exercise in the world happens twice a year on their border, where the big scary guys that invaded them in the past practice invading them all over again. So Lisa, what that shows is, look, look at it from the North Korean side, right? And, and that's the, if, you, if you bother to do that, you can resolve some of these wars, but that's what these people in America, like Mike Pence, do not want to do it. I'm, I'm distinguishing between him and Trump because Trump campaigned against this and he's been under this assault that's sort of dragging him in this direction. But I wanted to, and, and today something, or overnight, something terrible happened where the American military bombed the Syrian army in Syria, killing 100 soldiers that are fighting um, ISIS, mm. right? Again, they've done it again. And Trump was specific on that as well when he was the president, but, he, but he's been dragging that direction. And I just want to play this clip from the campaign, when Trump was campaigning, where he was asked about something Mike Pence said on Syria in, that, in the debate with Hillary, and he made it clear he didn't agree. So just have a quick look at that. I want to remind you what your running mate said. He said, provocations by Russia need to be met with American strength and that if Russia continues to be involved in airstrikes along with the Syrian government forces of Assad, the United States of America should be prepared to use military force to strike the military targets of the Assad regime. Okay. He and I haven't spoken and I disagree. I disagree. You disagree I with think your we running have to man. knock out ISIS. So Trump has had these instincts, but he's been surrounded by people like Mike Pence, who he's had to you know, do deals with, etc. And unfortunately, they're getting to call the shots at the moment, which is very, very bad. In countries like Australia, we live in the region, we should reject it all outright. Mm. And actually what you see, and call in for a copy of our Australian Alert Service, because you can read the details of how these war spots are actually aimed at containing Russia and China because Russia, well particularly China, are coming forward with economic development plans that can uplift the world and it's challenging the economic and financial might of the Wall Street City of London crowd at a time where, as we've mapped out, their it's financial closing. system is going down. So read it all for more details. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks Robert. Thank you. Join us again next week. Mm -hmm.